like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevning. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome. This collection of stories is being brought to you by William Jevning and are being narrated by me, Jim Sower. Story number one. Grand Marais, Cook County, Minnesota, 2011. Snowmobiler spot Sasquatch in Superior National Forest. My sighting occurred in Minnesota. The nearest city to the sightings is Grand Marais, Minnesota. The sighting was in the Superior National Forest on January 29, 2011, around 3.30 in the afternoon. The area has many lakes, and this sighting was near a tributary to one of the lakes. The nearest road to this area is Gunflint Trail. What I and my sister saw that day was incredible. We were snowmobiling in the back country of northern Minnesota when my family and I were approaching a downhill section of the trail we were on. There was a clearing on the hillside above us where there was a break in the trees. As I began my descent on the trail, I happened to look up and spotted something in the clearing about 200 yards above me. My sister and I were at the back of our group, so we both slowed to a stop to see what caught my attention. When we looked at what I saw, we observed a tall, man-like creature watching us. It stood there for about a minute, then reached up, grabbed a branch, and walked off into the trees. The creature we saw was maybe seven feet, and was dark brown in color, with darker areas around the face and chest area. It had long arms and a very human-like appearance, with a high forehead area. We grew up in this area and know the local wildlife extremely well. This is not a bear or moose. We have never seen anything like this before. My family has been somewhat skeptical about the sightings of these beings, so when we saw it, it really frightened us. Sorry, no photos, because I was on a snowmobile, and it is rather hard to carry a camera in an easily accessible place. We circled around and could see large barefoot tracks in the snow. The snow is so deep in Minnesota this year, so... It was hard to get close enough to get any pictures of the tracks, but you could definitely tell that a two-legged creature passed through the area where we saw it. I wish I had more evidence, but unfortunately I never dreamed that I would ever see something like this, so it really stunned us. My sister doesn't want to go there again, but I would really like to go back in the summer to see if there's anything to be found. This definitely made me a believer in Sasquatch. We did not report it to any authorities for fear of being ridiculed. My sister and I wish to remain anonymous for this same reason. But we would like the rest of our story to be shared so that others will know that they are not crazy if they see one of these creatures. Anonymous in Grand Marais, Minnesota, February 2012. That's the end of story number one. Story number two. A story out of Siskiyou County, California, approximately 1996. My name is Mark Kennedy, and I have a good story. It happened about ten years ago while a crew of twelve, including myself, was working a contract for the Forest Service to clear a couple miles of wilderness trail. I believe it was our first night at this particular spot, which was an area in the north end of the Trinity Alps. It was about 26 miles into the wilderness zone of the Trinity Forest. Camp was about five miles off the road in a beautiful meadow with a small lake called Red Cap Lake. We were done with our second day of work on this particular trail. It was a trail that took you through the prayer rocks of the Hoopa and Yurok tribes. Being in the Trinity Alps, obviously, we were really high up. We started at about 5,000 feet and maybe went up another thousand. The trail was about ten or twelve miles long, and split about three miles south of Red Cap Lake. One trail took you down into one of the many gorgeous secluded valleys in the Alps. The other took you to a point. Literally, the end of the trail was on a point that extended out quite a few feet from the true edge of the cliff. 
At that point, we were about 2,000 feet above the forest below us, so we were very remote. In the meadow, our first night there, we split into two groups trying to find the best camp spot. Really, not hard to do. The meadow was just about twice the size of a football field. Half was all knee-high green grass. The entire west side of the meadow was a small lake. You could catch pan-sized trout all day long in that little lake. Now our meadow was off the main trail which rode the peaks of the mountains we were on. You walked down into this meadow from the north end, and as you walked, you got a bird's-eye view of the entire area. At the south end of the meadow was an extremely rocky cliff that rose above the lake about 200 to 300 feet with the forest ending right at the edge at the top. So, now you understand the area a little as I tell this story. We were just finishing our nightly session to end the day around the campfire. Both campsites were at the south end of the grass near the rocks, not far from one another. Everybody had just grown quiet as we all were drifting off to sleep. Suddenly, there was this god-awful screaming, howling-like noise that echoed through the meadow to make it sound like the screaming was coming from all directions. And for what seemed to be forever, the strange noise finally stopped and was followed up by one of the trees at the top of the rock cliff getting pushed off. I swear that tree must have hit every single rock that was in its path on the way down. And as it grew closer, the more petrified I became due to its sounding like it was right on top of our camp. Finally, the crashing noise came to a stop without ever landing on someone's tent. I still couldn't move, though. I was frozen position and I still couldn't move, though. I was frozen position and seeing the brightest shade of yellow I've ever seen. I think the others were, too. Nobody wanted to come out of their tents, but everybody wanted the reassurance of the others. The rest of the night was uneventful. The next morning we were all around the campfire, sounding like a bunch of old biddies gossiping about the night before. We found the tree that came down. It was a full-grown fir. Must have been a full-sized tree when it started down the cliff. Wasn't much left of it when it got to the bottom. I have never heard that strange scream since, and have been back in the woods plenty. None of us could come up with a reasonable explanation for what we heard that night. Shortly thereafter, we were joined by a guide who was Native American. This guide informed us that the prayer rocks I wrote about earlier are on sacred ground, and it is believed that there is a Bigfoot protecting that whole mountain. The guide also went on to say that the noise has been heard before, but in other places. We discussed how big of a creature it would take to push over a full-grown pine or fir tree. We know it wasn't a bear, unless bears are coming up with horrifying new screams. So, it wasn't a bear, but it had to be big and strong. The tree circumference was about four, maybe five feet. And, we concluded from memory of seeing the tree, it was about fifty feet tall and very much alive. At least the parts we were looking at came from a live tree. Nobody would climb up the easy rocky cliff to see where the tree used to be located, so I couldn't tell you if there were any footprints or not. But I can say that this story was backburnered in my memory to tell at the campfires for entertainment. It became very interesting when I heard one of many documentaries about this screaming, howling-like noise that the Bigfoot has been known to make. When I heard that, all of a sudden, that night needed to be shared. This is the end of this story. Story number four. August 2007, Lake Tahoe, Placer County, California. Tracks found 18 inches long, 9 inches wide. I was camping last August with my nephew north of Lake Tahoe. We had been in a moderately developed campground, Crystal Peak Overlook, about 20 miles northwest of Reno, Nevada, where we live. There, my nephew made friends with another little boy, and I started talking to the other little boy's grandmother. She told me how her husband and son had found these big footprints that May along a creek above another nearby campground, Dog Valley Creek. They reported that in one print they could even make out separate tow tracks. They told a ranger who gave them some 
plastic tape to mark the spot. That got me curious, so we moved camp the next day to Dog Valley, a primitive campground. This is on the dry side of the Sierras at the Timberline, which is about 6,000 feet. Generally, the granite soil of the Sierras doesn't sustain much vegetation, but in this area several small streams converge to make a marshy pasture with a lot of biodiversity. We hiked up the creek that flows through the campground. It was a moderately steep climb. About a hundred yards up, I spotted the bits of tape tied to sticks stuck in the ground in a particularly thick patch of trees. The forest floor was covered with pine needles, but you could still see the depressed area of the prints sunk in the soil beneath leaves. In August, when we were there, even I, at over 200 pounds, didn't leave a footprint. But perhaps in May, in the deep shade, the ground had been muddy enough to take tracks. There were three prints marked out, but only one was still the outline of a full foot. However, I could no longer make out any separate toe impressions. It was about 18 inches long and nearly 9 inches wide. All the pictures I took came out pretty useless. Only the one where I put my bare foot in the tracks gives you any idea of size. The area is about 20 miles from human habitation, but gets hmm, maybe a dozen people a week off-roading during June through October. The roads to the area aren't cleared in the winter, so there's hardly anyone there until May. The area is in the rain shadow of the high Sierra Peak, so even in winter there's probably less than a couple feet of snow, and it has lots of springs. I'd guess this area would have edible vegetation, if not all winter, at least very early in the spring. This area is not too far south of the Cascade Range, where there are more Sasquatch reports, and might be the sort of area a species might migrate south to for the winter. My nephew asked if the footprint could be made by a really tall person, like a basketball player, so when I got home I did some net research. 18 inches would be a shoe size. 26. Many, many E's. The nearest I found was a guy 8 foot 4 who wears a size 25. There are less than a dozen people in the USA that tall, and most use canes or crutches and wouldn't be up to a barefoot hike in the mountains. I don't have a scanner, but I'll see if I can find a friend to scan the one halfway decent photo to you. Yes, I did have a camera, but it was a little 35 millimeter disposable, and the footprint I found is hard to make out, and the markings on the measuring tape I had in one picture can't even be made out at all. There may have been three prints, but only one was clear enough to be a definite footprint. Gina Bagney, date Friday, 1st of February, 2008. That's the end of story number four. This next story is entitled Wichita County, Arkansas, 1940s. I am 75 years old. I was raised in the county of Wichita in Arkansas. We used to hear Bigfoots during winter time. Dad says they were panthers. Till Dad and his brother saw five Bigfoots in a pool of water at a river bottom. My uncle never got over that shock and would not go into the woods again. Dad said they were ugly and the females had breasts that hung down to here, pointing to his body. I recall laying in that broad shack. It was cold listening to them scream and scream, and they did a lot. When I was all of five years old, my dad was out running trap line and doing some farming in the summertime. It was at this time that our canned goods began to go missing from our smokehouse. One time, whole smoked ham disappeared. We could not figure out who was taking the food. My dad told mother that he thought someone or something was following him when he was out running his trap lines. One day he spotted someone. The little fellow was about four and a half feet tall with hair all over him. It also had a hump back and was very ugly in the face which had facial hair. Dad began talking to it and leaving food for the little fellow. 
It wasn't long before when my dad would go into the woods and holler, the little guy would suddenly appear. We named him Little Sam, which was a name my grandpa had. Nobody knew about Little Sam outside of our family. All those years, Dad was in touch with Little Sam. I only saw him two times in my childhood. After I got married and moved to Oklahoma, my mother wrote me and told me about Dad and Little Sam, saying that they had not seen Little Sam in some time, but they went looking for him and found him dead. When I was reading the letter, I started to cry. It was very sad. Little Sam never uttered a word that I heard about, but he grunted. This is the end of story number five. This is story number six. Wild Man in McHenry County, Velva, North Dakota, 1908. The Stevens Point Journal, Stevens Point, Wisconsin, Saturday, February 16th. 1908. Captured a Wild Man. Curious find recently made at Velva, North Dakota. The journal is in receipt of a clipping from a Velva, North Dakota paper from J. Thomas, who is formerly a resident of Keene, a son of Mrs. John Thomas, who still lives at Keene. It relates to the discovery of an alleged wild man near Velva, not far from Mr. Thomas's home. It is stated, For three years there have been rumors of this wild man being seen by persons of veracity, but he had never been encountered at close range until a few days ago, when two cattlemen who were out hunting suddenly came upon him face to face as he emerged from a thicket of brush. One of them succeeded in throwing a lasso around him, and before he could escape, he was dragged to a tree and bound round and round with the lasso. Later he was bound hand and foot and carried to town on a dray, where he was imprisoned in a basement. His only clothing was a loin girdle of sheepskin tied with binder twine. He had not been shaved or had a haircut in years, and being a man of an extremely hairy variety, he presented a very grotesque and wild appearance. His eye teeth are reported to be unnaturally elongated in the form of tusks. He refused to talk or eat anything, but drank water like a horse, half a pail at a time. The singular part of it is that this man has always been seen within two miles of the village of Velva. This is the end of story number six. STORY NUMBER SEVEN Montgomery County, Arkansas, June 2008 On May 26, 2008, while the writer was in Clark County, Alabama, with area researchers, information was received by telephone from C.K., an Arkansas RFP research project investigator, that a married couple in the rural Montgomery County, Arkansas, had found evidence and had heard sounds that indicated more than one reclusive forest primate was foraging on their property at night. That information had been submitted to C.K. by the adult son of the woman who is joint owner and resident of the property. On June 7, 2008, C.K. and the property owner's son and the writer drove to the site and met with the couple. We arrived about 3 o'clock p.m., and left shortly after 11 o'clock p.m. The couple are in their late 40s, and both have daytime employment in Hot Springs. They have purchased a 16-acre tract of land in Montgomery County, and plan to build a home on it later. The north side of the property slopes to a small spring-fed creek. That hillside and the creek bottoms below are densely forested with various hardwoods, pine, and cedar. The underbrush has been cleared from the area of the planned home site. Along the creek, there is a very thick undergrowth of vines and brush. The land south of the creek was at one time cultivated, but it is now overgrown in brush, vines, and small trees through which trails have been cut with a bush hog. Throughout the property, there is a prolific growth of 
muscadine, summer grape, and blackberry vines. There are at least two pear trees in the old cultivated area, although the one seen by the writer appears to be ornamental Bradford pear. A neighbor told them that he had gathered pears from one of the trees. Earlier this year, the owners obtained utilities on the property, and in late February or early March, they opened a driveway through the timber on the north portion of the property. In late February of this year, they purchased a new travel trailer and installed it about 75 yards from the county road that is the northern boundary of the property. General information about the area. The actual location of the property is not disclosed at the owner's request. The property is within two miles of a river, which is a popular stream for canoeing and wade fishing. The site is within the foothills of the relatively small but rugged Caddo Mountains, which adjoin the southern flank of the Wichita Mountains. The area contains a large population of deer, turkey, and raccoon. The area has some cougar and no doubt many bobcat. A large male cougar was reportedly killed within one half mile of the property a short time ago. During this initial visit to the site, the writer noted a very fresh cougar track in the dust alongside the county road near the home where a wide, well-used game trail crosses the county road. While the area is expected to contain all the other small animals and birds common to this part of the state, it was surprising that no coyote sign was seen around the property, and when asked, the owner said they had never heard coyotes in the area. Summary of Events After moving into the travel trailer, the owners built a wooden porch patio underneath the trailer's retractable awning. While neither of the residents are hunters, and neither own a firearm, they are both avid bird and animal watchers. They have installed feeders for birds, and began putting out dog food and scraps for the raccoons. For some time the couple had been spreading corn on the ground in a spot in the woods in front, east of the trailer, and at another location on the opposite side of the trailer as food for the deer. Sometime after they started putting out corn for the deer, they found a carcass of a deer near the west side feeding area. The witnesses stated that one of the deer's front legs and its head had been torn off. The head was found a few yards away, but the leg was partially eaten nearby. Both of the deer's back legs were broken, and much of its hind quarters had been eaten before the carcass was found. They stated the deer's body cavity and stomach had been torn open, and the internal organs had been removed. There was undigested corn and corn mush inside the body cavity and spilled outside the carcass. When the carcass was again viewed the next day, they saw fresh blood and an exposed shoulder blade which indicated something had fed on the carcass overnight. A week or so later, another deer carcass was found at the other baiting site in front of the trailer. Both of the deer's back legs were broken, and the carcass torn open and partially consumed. Shortly after finding the last deer carcass, the couple stopped putting out corn because they thought a cougar was ambushing the deer at the baiting locations. A day or two later, the couple found an injured dog lying beside the porch early one morning. They don't own a dog. When they stepped outside, the dog managed to get up and walk away, but there was a large bloody area on the ground where it had been lying. Shortly after seeing the injured dog, they found out that another dog, a Rottweiler weighing close to 200 pounds and belonging to the neighbor, had been attacked or otherwise injured. Something had torn off one of that dog's back legs. According to the couple, the dog somehow managed to return to his owner's home and still was alive. The couple said that now the large dog usually just stays on the porch and will no longer leave the owner's yard. Investigators note, when C.K. and the woman's son and this writer were leaving the couple's home site and driving through the woods road toward the county road the night of the initial meeting, C.K., who was sitting in the front passenger seat, told me there was a deer in the woods on my side of the vehicle. I stopped and saw an animal that I at first thought was a coyote moving through the woods. As I entered a more open spot, we saw that it was a large dog. We then drove away. 
The next night, about 8.30 p.m., the property owner called to tell me that when he went outside early that morning, he found a dog badly injured at the old baiting site east of the trailer. He said that it appeared the dog's back or its hips had been broken. He said at the time that he did not think that the dog would survive, although he said the dog managed to drag itself away the next morning. From his description of the dog, it was the same one that the three of us had seen the night before. Shortly after finding the deer carcasses, the husband spoke to a neighbor about any strange things that had occurred on the neighbor's property. The neighbor reportedly told him that five of his sheep had been killed and ripped apart inside an enclosure. When asked what he thought had killed the sheep, the neighbor said he thought it was dogs because he found some type of terrier inside the enclosure when he found the dead sheep. The couple stated that they had often sat outside on the patio porch at night and early in the morning during the week. He arises about 4.30 a.m. on weekdays to make coffee, and she joins him outside for a few minutes later. They both leave for work about 5 a.m., they stated that on many occasions when they stepped outside before daylight, they would hear the sounds of something crashing through the woods and brush near the trailer. They assumed it was deer bounding away, although they thought it was odd that deer would make such noise leaving the area. They said that on several occasions they had heard loud, ape, or monkey-like sounds from the adjoining woods while sitting outside late in the evening and at night. Recently, it became apparent to them that at times the sounds were being made by more than one animal. A few weeks ago, a relative found a very large, about 18 inches long, track in a fire ant hill near the creek. The residents found another such track in one of their small vegetable gardens located northeast of the trailer. On the day of this initial visit, the writer observed two recently made tracks of about the same approximate size in the leaves and soil west of the trailer. The property owners also reported that some of the suet blocks used to feed birds were torn down and removed. They supposed that raccoons had taken the food, even though the couple thought they had suspended the blocks out of the reach of those animals. The husband began using wire to secure the door of the wire suet baskets so that raccoons could not open them if they managed to get them. Although the wife stated she could not open the baskets with her hands after her husband wired them shut, something continued to tear the baskets down and open them to obtain and consume the suet blocks. Recently, the couple began putting up hummingbird feeders. Two of the feeders are small, but one holds about a quart of sugared water. A few nights ago, when the large feeder was nearly full, something reached the feeder and drank the entire contents except for some spillage that coated the outside surface of the container. The feeder was elevated and suspended away from a tree trunk on an L bracket. Because of the position of the container and its capacity, the couple thinks it is unlikely that raccoons emptied it, although they concede that a raccoon might have been responsible. Other details. While completing this initial report, the writer telephoned the reporting witnesses at 8.40 p.m. on June 10th to ask about a few details. After clarifying the details, the husband asked if he could pose a question to me. When I told him that, of course, he could, he asked if I had ever heard whooping-type sounds, which he began to imitate over the phone. The sounds he made were nearly identical to the whooping sounds attributed to the reclusive forest primates. When I told him the possible source of the sounds, he said that both he and his wife had heard those sounds about 20 minutes earlier, coming from the opposite side of the creek and downstream. After some discussion, he said that he might go onto the porch and make those sounds to see what would happen. I advised him to be extra careful because the animals might be much closer than when he heard them originally. This is the end of this collection of stories. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. 
All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs>